In today's video, let's discuss population ecology, which covers the sections 8.3 and 8.4 in this final unit of AP Biology. Hey guys, this is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy, and on this channel, we cover all things AP Bio. In today's video, we'll be covering one of the first major topics in ecology, analyzing the dynamics of a single population, as well as the interactions of individuals within it. So let's go ahead and talk about just what you're expected to know for this course and the exam. Now, at this point in the course, we're moving away from looking at specific processes that are happening within individuals or even between generations, but rather the dynamic nature of how individuals individual organisms interact with the world around them. And in 8.3 and 8.4, we specifically focus on the study of organisms at the population level. So what exactly is a population? In biology, population is defined as a group of individuals of the same species living in the same general area. So while the definition seems simple enough, there are several specific concepts we need to know for this course. So let's go ahead and list them off here. First, dynamics of growth. Second, limitations on the growth growth. Third, properties of populations, including distribution and life history traits. And lastly, how we estimate population sizes. I think with these four major ideas mastered, you'll be more than well prepared for this part of the AP Bio curriculum. So let's first talk about the dynamics of growth and discuss how we can mathematically model changes in population sizes. With all living organisms, the continuity of life, whether through asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction, is one of its key defining features. Another unifying characteristic of life, of course, is death. So it goes without saying then that any given population at some moment in time would experience change in its number of individuals due to both births and deaths of its members. Adding to this though, we also have to consider immigration and emigration, which we've discussed before in our discussion of gene flow. Because metapopulations can give and take individuals, we can consider both immigration and emigration as a means to alter the population size. So when we talk about this mathematically, we can actually combine births and immigration together as factors that increase the population size, while deaths and emigration can be combined together as factors that decrease its size. And here we see how we can model this in a simple mathematical equation. But for the purpose of this course, we generally refer to both births and immigration as capital B and deaths and emigration as capital D. Just a heads up that capital and lowercase letters can mean different things in this course. But in light of this, we can simply modify our mathematical model as the following. Now in this model, we're now using some new terms here. The delta symbol here represents the term a change in, while n and t refer to population size and time respectively. So in simple terms, this equation simply means a change in population size over time will be the difference between births and deaths. Now this B minus D could be both positive or negative, indicating an increase or a decrease in population size. For instance, if 200 new individuals were born while 120 individuals died, then the difference of a positive 80 would mean that the population would grow by 80 individuals. But the problem with this model is that there's just no consideration of the current size of the population, which means that while we know the growth and the decline in raw numbers, we don't know what that change is being applied to. So here we see how we can add that information of the size of population in defining the capital B variable that takes into account not just the raw numbers of births, but rather the rate of birth per capita within the population. As mentioned before, note that the letter B is now in its lowercase, which intuitively refers to the rate of birth rather than the actual numbers of individuals being born. This is what we call the per capita birth rate and is expressed as a decimal number. For instance, if there were 20 individuals born to a population of 1,000, then the per capita birth rate can be calculated by simply dividing 20 births by 1,000 individuals, giving us a birth rate of 0.02. Now, no matter what the population size is, we'll be able to figure out just how many individuals would be added. For instance, supposing that we apply this per capita birth rate of 0.02 to a population of 5,000 instead, then we could use the equation from before and determine that the number of births would be 100 new individuals in the next generation. So it's pretty simple. Now, you can use the same logic to calculate the death rate, which is technically referred to as the per capita mortality rate. The equation is similar and is as follows. So again, we see that the number of actual deaths can be calculated by applying the rate of death per capita times the size of the population. Now here is where things get a little bit more interesting. I can now take the original population of 
delta n over delta t is equal to b minus d, and replace each one of those variables with their newly defined variables to make it like this. Now, so far so good, but here's where most students get confused. Supposing that we factor out n, we could rewrite this equation as the following. And it turns out that we can simply define lowercase r to mean that b minus m combining the per capita birth and mortality rate into a single per capita rate of growth. So in its final form, a change in the population size can be modeled as dn over dt equals rn. Do keep in mind that if the mortality rate is higher than the birth rate, then b minus m would naturally become a negative value, resulting in a negative r. Supposing that we want to calculate how a population might change from time one to time two, we can even use an equation like this. Here, the rn would represent the change to that initial population of n at t equals one. So for instance, a population of 100 bears has a per capita rate of increase of 0.05. Well, what would be the population size in the next generation? Well, here we can say that n at time two is equal to 100 plus 0.05 times 100, resulting in 100 plus five or 105 bears in the next generation. Just keep in mind that this change of five could have resulted from say 12 births and seven deaths, or any other combination of births and deaths. Now that we have the dynamics of population size all covered, let's discuss factors that could increase or decrease population growth and ultimately the size of the population. Well, actually, we don't really talk too much about what increases population growth because life uh, finds a way. But what we really want to discuss here is what limits the population size. As you can imagine, even asexually reproducing organisms should exhibit exponential behavior in its growth, considering one becomes two, two becomes four, four becoming eight, and so on. And that's just what we see here. But in reality, as Thomas Malthus and Darwin had previously stated, all living things are limited due to the finitude of resources in their environments. So the reality here is that a more realistic model of population growth is needed, and here we're introduced to the logistics growth model. As this image shows, the growth starts off slowly, enters an exponential phase, only to be curbed as the slope decreases towards an asymptote, where it just sort of flattens out. This asymptote is referred to as k, or carrying capacity, and it represents the limit of the population size in a particular environment. Just remember that unlike in a math class, the asymptote can be passed, but the population would simply start to decline, oscillating about that carrying capacity. And while there is a mathematical model to describe this behavior, that's not actually all that important for AP biology. What you actually have to know are factors that limit population growth, both density dependent and density independent. Density dependent factors that limit population growth affect this decrease in slope as the population approaches carrying capacity. This makes sense as these are things that make it harder and harder for populations to grow as it becomes larger and larger in size. Some examples of density dependent factors include resource limitations, both space and food, uh, increase in waste products or toxins with the population increase or increased transmission of infectious diseases, and the list goes on. With these factors, as the population needs years K, the per capita rate of increase would begin to decrease as birth rate declines and mortality rate increases. However, there are also factors that limit population sizes that are not dependent on the density at all. These density independent factors typically include natural disasters or other stochastic events that can still put a limit on the population. For instance, a large tsunami that wipes out a population on an island would not depend on whether that population was 100 individuals or 10,000 individuals. So let's move on to our third point of discussion, properties of populations. First, let's discuss something called patterns of dispersion. Dispersion patterns are how individuals situate themselves among other members within their geographical range. This is mostly based on numerous intrinsic biological properties or even social behavioral patterns. In biology, we generally see three major types of dispersion dispersion, clumped, uniform, and random. Clump dispersion patterns see many members of the population that are clustered together in aggregate patches. This can occur when a particular resource is distributed in such a manner to attract many individuals to a patch, or when prey species aggregate together as a defense or deterrent measure against their predators. In uniform distribution, we see each individuals in roughly equidistant positions in an area. In animals in particular, we see uniform distribution in organisms that are territorial and may use signals or pheromones to create their circle of influence, so to say. In random dispersion is just as the name suggests. A great example of this distribution is dandelions in a field where windblown seeds would naturally land in 
individuals in a roughly random fashion. The second property of population has more to do with something called life history traits of populations. Let's take a look at something called survivorship curves. In biology, we say that there are three kinds of survivorship curves that explain the history of populations over the lifespan of individuals within. Type 1 curve represents the pattern seen in species like ourselves, where the mortality rate of infants or young individuals is relatively low, but older individuals will begin to die with a relatively steep curve due to senescence at some point in its life. Type 2 curves represent the life history of species that have a constant threat of mortality throughout its life. As a result, the curve is fairly linear. In type 3 curves, we see populations that have high mortality rate when young, but the rate of mortality actually decreases as the individuals get older and older. Bivalves like mussels typically exemplify this curve with high mortality during very early stages of its life with not a lot of threats once the hard shell is fully formed in adulthood. In life history traits, we also see two major types of reproductive strategies that you should be familiar with. First is called iteroparity, where organisms will have multiple reproductive events within its lifetime. Second is semel parity, where organisms will invest all their eggs in one basket or one big reproductive event just before dying. Some famous examples of semel species include salmon who swim back to the river where it was born to lay its own eggs before dying. Now, the last thing that you need to know about population ecology is how we estimate population sizes. For AP biology, the main technique that you want to familiarize yourself with is called the mark recapture method. Supposing that we're dealing with a population too large to count manually, here's what you can do. First, capture a random sample of individuals and mark them with some identifying tag or markers that have been demonstrated not to impact their survival. Then you release them back into the population and give it time for them to intermix with the remaining population. Then recapture another random sample and by using the number of the original sample, the new sample, and the number of individuals marked in this new sample, you can estimate the size of the whole population. The formula is as follows. In this equation, x represents the the number of marked individuals in the second sampling, n for the total number of animals in the second sampling, s for the number of marked and released individuals in the first sampling, and n the estimated population size. So supposing that we capture 30 individuals, mark them and let them intermix and recapture 20, we might see that three of those 20 recaptured individuals are marked. Here we can simply plug in our values, 3 over 20 is equal to 30 over n, which gives us 3n is equal to 600, and n being 200 as our population estimate. What we're doing is simply using proportions to determine how our initially marked individuals represent a portion of the whole population as the recaptured marked individuals represent a portion of the sample of that population. With these four major themes in population ecology, you have pretty much learned everything that you need to know for the AP course and the exam. And while we did discuss a lot of equations and numbers in this video, just remember that the May exam is more interested in how these concepts interlink with other ideas in ecology rather than making you guys crunch numbers. Hey, if you found this video helpful, be sure to click that like button and subscribe to the channel for more content just like this. This. More importantly, share it with your friend, whether they're in AP Bio or not, just to confuse them. This has been Mikey with Avo Prep Academy. See you in the next video.